What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff. I'm Andrea Renee, back from three weeks off the grid with Christine Steimer. How's it going? Hello. Uh, it's good. We missed you. I know. Although I now you guys too. we have Brittany gone. <laughs> I know. We were looking at the calendar a couple of months back. I was like, man. That timed out not so great, but say la vie, such is life as the French say. Uh, but she'll be back next week and all three of us, of course, will be together this Saturday, February 23rd, starting at 12 p.m. noon Pacific time. We will begin our happy hour Q&A for the month of February for all of our fantastic patrons out there at patreon.com slash what's good games. If you are an upgraded patron at the after hours tier, that will begin at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Now, we've talked about playing Anthem together. So we're still going to work out the logistics because we're all playing remotely. So you would only be able to see my gameplay screen. So I'm figuring out a way um, to pipe in camera feeds from Steimer and Britt. And I'm not sure we're going to be able to make that happen, but we'll we'll try to work something out. Um, if yeah. it becomes too either way, you'll have my beautiful voice. Exactly, but if it <laughs> becomes too complicated to play Anthem specifically because of that reason, or if Anthem launches on console on Friday and it's like a hot tire fire of server errors, which is possible, um, we might True. pivot to something else. So, um, if you have specific feedback, of course, I'm going to be posting the links. By the time the show airs, the links will have already been posted uh, on Patreon.com/slash What's Good Games. So, if you want to take advantage of those amazing opportunities to interact with us please go check it out and let us know what you think so i have a couple other announcements as well uh, brit has mentioned that at pax east in boston from march 28th excuse me through march 31st we are going to be there playing some video games meeting up with you guys and of course hosting a panel what's good games live the panel is at 6 30 p.m pacific time that Thursday, March 28th, in the Bobcat Theater. We'll have more details about what's going to be happening at the panel once we get closer and more details about where the meet and greet is. As you know, we had it at the Whiskey Priest last year. That building is completely gone. It's demolished. It's been bulldozed to the ground. So we need to find a new spot. So uh we can all stand around <laughs> on its ashes and drink some things out of brown paper bags because I'm pretty sure they'll arrest us if they know we're drinking. Um, you know, it's Boston. They might be cool with it. Wait, no. They're I don't know. Not cool I don't think it. so. No, Boston's yeah. not cool. I think they're building like a high rise like condominiums there. So I don't oh. even know if we can stand on its ashes anymore. Probably not. That was mostly a joke. But <laughs> See, I was ready. I was in. I was. You were I was like, you know what? Plan. Yes. <laughs> Um, so mark it in your calendars if you're going to be at PAX we would love to see you um, and of course one more thing before PAX happens we've been teasing for a long time now that we're going to be doing some Patreon changes don't worry nothing to be afraid of it's all good stuff trust me and we're going to host a live stream for you guys after we make that announcement to answer any questions you have and have a town hall um, so we would love for you to join us that is on Saturday, March 16th, ahead of GDC, which is very exciting. And we will also be doing our Patreon students for the month of March, I believe, either that Saturday or that Sunday. TBD. But don't worry. You'll be the first to know, guys. All right. That is... Um, enough um announcements i want to remind you we put up an extra piece of content this week when by we i mean brit she's in hawaii of course and so she put up a vlog where she is very hot in the sun but it's rainy it's weird hawaii um and she's talking about animal crossing so if you guys want to hear her, her ask you questions and talk about her experience playing animal crossing for the first time which is weird Steiner, did you know she had never played animal crossing before that is weird, only because I know she likes Nintendo things. Like, if she had never really messed around in Nintendo land, that might make sense. But no, that seems like a game she would really like. Yeah, I just assumed that she had played Animal Crossing based off all the conversations we have. But guess I was wrong. Um, so she's playing that while it's raining in Hawaii. But she'll be back next week, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I have a note in the show notes to remind you guys that 
We originally said that we were going to do the Life is Strange 2, episodes 1 and 2, spoiler cast, next week. So we wanted to just remind you, however... Uh oh! You raised your hand, Steimer. Oh no! I was just like, oh, holy shit! I forgot about. That. I know. That's why I wanted to remind everybody: if you've been putting off playing the episodes, now's the time to boot it up this weekend uh, ahead of next week's show. However, I was gonna say, I found out that there's gonna be some awesome members of the development team from Don't Nod in San Francisco during GDC, and I have inquired with them if they would be interested in doing the spoiler cast with us. Oh, that'd and be fun. And we're trying to work out if they can fit it into their schedule because they have a very busy week while they're here and we don't want to impose on them too much. So there is a very small chance that we might move the spoiler cast out a few more weeks, but only to include the members of Don't Nod, the people who make Life is Strange. And if that's the case, hopefully you guys will think, hey, that's pretty cool. It's worth a wait of another couple of weeks. So... I will give you an update on that once we figure the schedules out for GDC. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, all right. So I think before we get into the news, I want to give a big thank you to our three wonderful sponsors for the show, Smile Direct Club, Grammarly, and Me Undies. We're going to talk about that soft, soft underwear a little bit later in the show. And we're going to start with Smile Direct Club. Are you a smile hider? Do you hide your teeth in group pics or just not smile when meeting someone? You know who you are out there. Because maybe you don't like how your teeth look. Let's get something straight. Your teeth. The ones that you cover when you laugh or hide or whenever someone breaks out a camera. With Smile Direct Club, you can straighten your teeth with invisible aligners sent directly to you. For only $80 a month, you can have a smile you'll love with a lifetime of confidence. And Smile Direct Club means no monthly office visits and no pain of fortune. The invisible aligners work gently and discreetly to gradually guide your teeth into alignment and one of their 200 plus duly licensed doctors oversee your plan every step of the way. Go to smiledirectclub.com to see real before and after photos of more than 350,000 satisfied grins. That's a lot of sets of choppers. You guys can order a free impression kit with a rebate or schedule a free 3D scan at one of their smile shops. Plus, Smile Direct Club has an exclusive offer just for listeners of What's Good Games. Get $150 off your invisible aligners at smiledirectclub.com slash podcast. You, you need to use the offer code What's Good. So if you guys are listening, this offer is for you. That's right, $150 off of smiledirectclub.com slash podcast and use that offer code what's good to get your discount. One more time, smiledirectclub.com slash podcast. Offer what's good. All right, next up, we've got Grammarly. Grammarly is a communication tool that helps people improve their writing to be mistake-free, clear, and effective. They encourage everyone, even the best students and top professionals, to use Grammarly to do their best work and accomplish even more of their goals. So what exactly is Grammarly, you might be asking yourself. It's a writing assistant that makes you look and sound smarter. Start off the new year by easily improving yourself and your communication at work, school, and almost anywhere with Grammarly. They help people show their best self through writing and are available across platforms, including online browser extensions, desktop editors, and mobile keyboard checkers. Grammarly is available in browsers like Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, and platforms like iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac. And did I mention it's free? You heard correctly, you don't have to pay anything to get started. Their free product reviews critical spelling and grammar. But when you're ready to really step up your grammar game, Grammarly Premium looks out for spelling grammar plus advanced punctuation, structure, style with context, vocabulary suggestion, conciseness, and readability for different occasions. For example, it can help you with your cover letters for jobs, your PAX panel proposals, or maybe even your Dear WGG letters. You guys know you make some mistakes in those letters sometimes. Hey, I make <laughs> mistakes when I write back to you. We're in this together. But now we've got Grammarly. Polish up your resume to get that new job, or maybe just stop making typos on your phone, which I literally do every day. Uh, fun fact, did you know that the word literally got flagged in my last Grammarly check because I use it too often, apparently? Yeah, it flagged me for using something um, too many times. They're like, hey, did you know that you've used the word literally like 17 times in this email? And I was like, oh, dang. I did not realize that. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, my bad. Stop using filler words by heading to Grammarly.com slash what's good to get 20% off your Grammarly premium account today. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash what's good. Grammarly.com slash what's good for 20% off your premium 
Grammarly account today. I was really surprised by how well Grammarly worked and how easy it was to integrate into um, all of the email apps that I use on my Chrome extension. So if you guys are struggling with your writing, because let's be honest, a lot of us have kind of like let it go a little bit since our college days, but Grammarly is here to help. All right, now it's time for the news. First up, Steimer, I want to mm-hmm. know, how are you? I feel like I haven't seen you in a long time. I'm, you know, I'm good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> plug it away at life, really. Just keep it on, keep it on. Well, I'm excited that we have some travel in the books for you to come back to San Francisco. I'm stealing you away to talk about Patreon stuff. It's going to be very exciting. You're, wait, what? what? <laughs> in March, when you're here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I misunderstood what you just said. I was like, what are you stealing me? What's happening? Well, yes. I mean, and I'm I'm going to force you to come down to GDC for a little bit. I know you've got like, you know, work. And I've stuff. got like a gerb. A gerb. Like Gerbs another gerb. Cool. It's true. Um, but speaking of GDC, this was my segue. Mm. <laughs> oh, good. I see. I see what you're doing <laughs> A there. really bad segue that I kind of did a, too long of a workaround for. You know, it's, it's been, it's, we, you know, we've had, you've been on a break. It's been, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little rough, rough chuckles getting back in. So GDC, of course, is the Game Developers Conference. It's happening here in San Francisco starting March 18th through the 22nd, I believe. And Google has announced that they are holding a mysterious event at GDC. So a bunch of members of the media received a press invitation to come and see what Google has been up to. So we've been talking a lot about what Google could possibly be doing in the gaming space. We've seen a lot of people try Project Stream, which is their game streaming service that they kind of did a test run for with Assassin's Creed Odyssey late last year. And now they're finally ready to unveil it. And before we speculate, about what they are going to unveil. I thought it was pertinent to read this question from Dear WGG writer Brandon, who says, hello, what's good? This week in light of the Google announcing their plans to showcase what they've been working on for gaming at next month's GDC. I was curious if you feel this is one of the most anticipated presentations from the conference in its history. Are there any examples of major news items equal impact to come to GDC's past? Thanks again for taking my submission if you do and have a wonderful rest of your day. So do you remember, Steimer, any really big GDC announcements? I've got a couple I can think of. Then you go, because off the top of my head, no, but I also am very tired. Yes. That's... <laughs> well, while you think about it, um, one of the biggest announcements that I immediately thought of, Brandon, when you asked this question was the reveal of Project Morpheus, which was later dubbed PlayStation VR. And that happened at a GDC press event in the middle of the week because PlayStation always has a very big presence at GDC because it's an opportunity for them to, you know, get together with developers and talk about their platform. And I'm sure PlayStation is going to be having meetings this year talking about PS5 because we know we're kind of getting near the end of the PS4 life cycle. And while obviously PlayStation 5 has not been announced yet, we all know it's in the works and that it's coming. Um, So that's a really big announcement that I thought of right away that happened at GDC. And it used to be a bigger platform for announcements um, than it has been in the past. And now they're really kind of gearing it more towards developers than to consumers. Because I remember several years ago when I saw Uncharted 4 for the very first time at a GDC press event in a, in a giant suite. And there was a big like theater presentation. And it was really cool. But we don't really see a ton of really elaborate game demos like that at GDC. It really focuses on mobile game development and indie games. At least it has in the last couple of years. It doesn't mean that we're not making some appointments and seeing some stuff, but just historically it used to be a much bigger showcase event for software than it has been in recent years. Another there was also oh, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was going to say I, I, the only my main memories of GDC because for the most part I haven't attended um, was when I worked at IGN and Going there, it wasn't necessarily to see games, but what we would do is we would go to panels that were about larger software titles and try to like pull news or interesting bits out of those uh, talks with those developers and seeing like, and I, I think they, they basically still do that today. Um, but that to me has always been, been what the show has been about. I think maybe because of that experience. <laughs> so like for the most part, GDC is uh, a time to network and not, necessarily a huge time for events for me anyway 
or like for usually not a lot of massive announcements happening here no that's usually that's absolutely true we usually have like one tentpole announcement i remember a few years back when epic games who always has a massive presence at gdc because of unreal engine um, they have several different booths on the gdc expo floor and they do tons of different talks ranging from a variety of topics and I remember when they held a press conference talking about the state of Unreal and they announced that they were opening up the Unreal licensing and essentially making Unreal free and that you would just have to pay like a percentage of your royalties because it used to be that you have to you used to have to buy a license to, to develop with Unreal. And that was huge news when that came out when it did. So I have no doubt they have something up their sleeve for Epic Game Store since that's been at the forefront of a lot of their publicity over the last couple of weeks slash months. But uh, when it comes to Google, we really have never seen Google at GDC in the form that I think it's going to be at this year. Now, YouTube gaming has always kind of been lingering in the background, but development is really not what YouTube gaming was all about. I mean, as you know, you used to work there. It's really more, about, <laughs> it's really been more about content creators. And so just as a disclaimer to people, like Steimer's not allowed to comment on this topic because of her former working relationship with YouTube. So I'm just going to give you guys like a brief rundown of what I think Google's going to um, going to show. And then I'm going to recommend if you want to hear more, please check out the episode of Kind of Funny Games Daily that I hosted with Greg earlier this week. It's the episode from Tuesday. You can check it out on their YouTube channel or their podcast feed. Um, and basically what I said on that episode was, you know, we've been hypothesizing about what Google's going to do in the video game space. And I'm going to echo what I said there that I, I feel strongly that they're going to show some kind of small device, some kind of box, a la Chromecast, something that works with their cloud services and game streaming, but still is something retail that they can put inside of a Best Buy or a Target or on Amazon.com, something that they can sell to you in a box um, that is going to be really revolutionary in the way that people play games. I want to believe they're going to take the vision that Ouya had way back in the day. Do you remember Ouya, Steimer? Of course I remember <laughs> Ouya. I think I still have one in a box somewhere. Ouya. That's um, how I'd like to say it. Yeah. Well, they want, they tried to do something revolutionary and obviously failed. And I think Google clearly has the resources to succeed and really pick up where that vision meant to be for like open source development and game streaming technology and a digital future and really, you know, um, get the ball going there. But I don't know when we're going to see this technology made available. We don't know what platforms it's all going to be on. We don't know who their gaming partners are going to be. That's really, to me, going to be the interesting thing to watch is to see if they get any exclusive deals with any publishers. I don't think they will because I think the install base across Switch, Xbox, and PlayStation is just too big to ignore for any publisher um, unless it's a really small indie dev that is that they're taking a chance on. But... That's not to say that they might not have like a smaller double A or single A game that they're launching with. Like, hey, today try out Google Stream or whatever they're going to call it um, and play X game today. You know, that's possible. But um, we obviously will bring you guys an update once that happens. It's just a couple of weeks away. Let us know what no, you think. Well, it's. We still have time, Andrea. It's not, the month is not over. <laughs> I know. I think I just realized February is so short because, yeah. you know, it's got fewer days than the rest of them, which is always, I always forget that until you get to the end of the month and you're like, oh yeah. I mean, we technically have three weeks. Four, is it four weeks? It, it, mm. I'm literally looking at my calendar right now. We have I know. One, I'm, I'm also pulling two, mine up. I'm like, three oh, weeks. It's three weeks until GDC. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> Sooner than you thought. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, but we will, of course, keep you updated and let you know what Google is up to at GDC. All right, next. Media Molecules Dreams enters paid early access this spring on PS4. Steimer, would you like to read this one? Sure. Let me just move this bad boy over here so I can read it a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Media Molecule has announced that Dreams, its PS4 game creation tool set, will be getting a paid but, quote, strictly limited early access release on the PlayStation Store this spring with a full launch to follow. Springs also in quotations. I'm not sure why. I'm assuming that's because there's no <laughs> actual date. <laughs> um, spring is the concept. Anyways, uh, in a post on the PlayStation blog, the developer explained that it's taking the early access approach for Dreams as a way to, quote, Oh, sorry, as a 
quote, way to put the game in the hands of our most enthusiastic dreamers and allow us to continue crafting and polishing it for everyone. Uh, the, this early access release as Media Molecule is intended for creators who, quote, want to be part of the dreams experience from the beginning and who want to create, play others' creations, get involved in social features of dreams, and give us feedback. As such, the early access edition of Dreams won't include the full feature set planned for final release, but will offer, quote, <laughs> so many quotes, 100% of the same Dreams tools that we have used every day at Media Molecule to make our content, as well as fun, deep, interactive tutorials catering for all skill sets and levels, and Media Molecule crafted arcade games ready to play and remix. It will also be compatible with creations made during the recent Dreams beta for those hoping to pick up where they left off. Um... More features, tutorials, arcade levels, and assets will be added as early access development continues, and Media Molecule will also be launching Dream's live service elements. So, quote, the community can get their first look at how we'll continue to support the game. Additionally, early access adopters won't be asked to sign an NDA, meaning they can share their creations publicly through the likes of streaming services and social media. Um, so it's called Dream's Early Access. will be available at the PlayStation Store to those in the UK, US, Australia, Austria, Benelux? Wow. Yeah, okay. that's, a, 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 that's the, the Belgium, Luxembourg. There's another country in that little triangle. Okay, there. I was like, am I that? I, I thought myself fairly worldly, but I don't know what the no, fuck yeah, Benelux it's an ab is. It's abbreviation. So yes, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Oh, I've never heard that as a, a like conjoined region. Anyways, okay, cool. Good to know. I know all those countries. Good. <laughs> I'm not uneducated. <laughs> New Zealand, France, Switzerland, Italy, Germany, and Spain. It will cost $29.99 US dollars and $29.99 uh, euro as well. So this is speculation from the article, which actually, where is this from? I don't know. Um, it's says from like, Eurogamer. Ah, Eurogamer. Okay. They're speculating between 23 pounds and 30 pounds in the UK. Um, and Medium Molecule has not really elaborated more on that or offered an actual release date but says that interested parties should go register for email updates to receive further information. So this is pretty interesting that they're finally putting like a flag down to say, okay, we're ready to come. And I, I'm actually really excited and happy that they decided to go with this plan, this early access plan to kind of roll out the launch. Because I think this game would have suffered terribly if it came to retail without an early access period for them to build uh, user-generated content and also for them to work out any kinks and bugs and to figure out how the heck do you market this game anyway? Yeah, that's always been the question for this. Um, the one thing that I feel a little bit... I mean, I agree that it needs some sort of an early access. I love that they're trying to use creators to give feedback and really build out this game and make it something that people can understand and not necessarily be intimidated by. However, my issue is that they're charging $30 for it. And I think I would feel maybe better about it if the people who are in this early access edition get some sort of creditation or anything. I don't know. It just feels a little bit odd to make people pay to come in to essentially flesh out your game. Like, in all intents and purposes, they're doing you a favor. I see what you're saying, but I would counter that paid early access is quite common. It is a thing. I just disagree with it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it's being funded by Sony's Worldwide Studios, which is a whole different ball of wax than a lot of the games that we see come to early access on Steam or even smaller indie games that come to game preview on Xbox and other platforms, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm with you there. I think what they're saying is, hey, we have to not make this free to play, essentially, because we have to yeah, limit. Yeah, I don't think that this game would lend itself well in. to that. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think maybe, I mean, they're saying how selective it is. So if it's that tiny, I guess maybe even if it was slightly cheaper, I would feel a little better about it. If it was like 15 bucks. Like, I don't know what scale they're really talking about here. Um, for their quote unquote limited. And I don't think they are really going to specify. Right. Um, but, uh, and the, t and it's not to say you shouldn't pay for this tool set. I think the tool set looks incredible. Yeah. Did you watch the, any of the projects that have come out of it so far? They did, they put out a little like montage trailer when they, Oh made no, I haven't gotten to see that. Um, definitely worth pulling up and taking a look at, even if you watch it without the sound, because it's, 
mind blowing what people have made so far with dreams, even in this early stage with the tool sets not being complete. And I think we always had a hunch that dreams was going to be kind of really revolutionary and innovative when it comes to UGC content. I mean, Media Molecule clearly has a long history of that with Little Big Planet, but what they're doing with dreams is really allowing a, a fledgling game maker who doesn't know how to use Unity or Havoc or Unreal, the opportunity to maybe realize their vision with tools that are very user friendly. And some of the stuff that people have made looks so neat and so cool. I mean, somebody recreated PT in, <laughs> in dreams, which is wild. Yeah. No, yeah, again, that's not, I'm not trying to like knock dreams itself because I think it's a really interesting, I don't even know that I would call it a game. Game maker almost is more of what it is. It's game maker where you can enjoy other people's creations. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just being weird about it. It's possible. I get weird about shit sometimes. <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay to be weird about it. I understand the hesitation. And I think generally when we hear early access, we associate it with something that's pretty broken. And I haven't heard or seen any reports on the subreddits of dreams being broken. It just feels like it's clearly not complete yet, but they're being yeah. very transparent about that. Even here, they're saying it's a strictly limited release. Uh, it They're calling it early access. And um, I, I think that it's important for them to be as transparent as possible when they're onboarding people into the beta. And I would hope that the people that are reaching out to Media Molecule to be involved in the beta so far truly want to take advantage of the, those tool sets because we know that they're going to have a campaign. We know they're going to have um, pre-made dreams, um, that they're going to have a playlist of dreams that the Media Molecule staff has made. And that there's going to be things to play out of the box, even if you have no desire whatsoever to take advantage of those tool sets like me. I'm just not creative enough to make my own dream. I really just have no desire to do that. But I would love to Don't play. Don't say that. You have dreams. <laughs> oh, thanks, Timer. <laughs> Someday I might make a game. No, I'm never going to make a game. It's not for me. Um, but I am excited to see what people are going to do based off even the small sliver of what they've shown so far. I think the potential is huge. I also think... They need to get their copyright and intellectual property um, rules and regulations in place and under control because I still haven't gotten a clear answer for them on how they're going to work that because if somebody makes Super Mario Brothers 2 in dreams, like you think Nintendo's not going to be like, um, excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> I think not. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I'm not sure how that's going to work. And they haven't been forthright about that. I'm sure their legal team is buried under a mountain of IP law going, how are we going to do this? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, it's easier um, on things like PC because you can kind of be like, you can, do, you can feign ignorance there a little bit easier versus something like PlayStation where it's a more closed ecosystem. Right. Um, and it's like, no, nah, you knew. <laughs> You have trackers in there, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But hopefully this means that they'll, you know, launch an early access now and that we could potentially see a full retail release at holiday this year. Hmm? Maybe. 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 I suppose it, go it depends on how this early access goes. <laughs> Indeed. Isn't that always yes. the case? Well, um, if you guys have made anything in Dreams, we would love to see it. Please. Oh, totally. Text us. Not text us. <laughs> email us. <laughs> We don't, don't have don't a what's, we don't have a what's good games <laughs> phone number. It's not a thing that exists. Um, it's contact at what's good games .com. You can always email us. You can tweet to us. I think was the word I was going to say at what's good underscore games. Um, you can also post it in on our Facebook wall or in the what's good games fan page. We would love to see your dream come true. Oh my goodness. Can I read the next one? Yes, you can it's girl. Near and dear to my heart. <laughs> oh, so sad. PS Vita will soon end production in Japan wah, via Tech Radar. Oh, I know. So we knew it was coming, but it doesn't hurt any less. Production of the PS Vita in Japan is coming to an end. According to the official PlayStation Japanese website uh, and spotted by another website, shipments of the basically PS Vita Black and PS Vita Aqua Blue are scheduled to quote end soon. These are the only two PS Vita models still in production in Japan, which means the handheld consoles end is in sight. While the news is heartbreaking, it's not actually a surprise. Sony revealed last year that it would be ceasing uh, production of the PS Vita in Japan in 2019, 
the handheld console's biggest market. European and U.S. production of the PS Vita has already ended, and for March 2019, PS Vita and PlayStation 3 games will no longer be included in the PS Plus monthly lineup. This is sad for me. I mean, it's not surprising, again, as the, as the article says. But I loved the shit out of my Vita for quite a while. I platinum Persona 4 Golden on it, which was 300-ish hours. That's a lot. I still remember <laughs> getting that platinum. I remember getting the one trophy that was giving me so much grief and standing up in my living room and like fucking dancing around because I was so excited. Um, yeah. I was just, I little. it was probably like 1130, almost 12 <laughs> at our roommate at the time, I think had just walked in and I was like, ah! <laughs> he was like, what the fuck? And I was like, I got the trophy. And he obviously, we, we were all gamers. So he was very excited for me. <laughs> That's but. good. I'm glad he was excited for you instead of like, yeah, cool story, bro. No, no, no. He was like, oh, what? Fuck, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and then it's also kind of weird. So once upon a time when I worked at PlayStation, I, I did the PS Plus monthly videos telling people about the lineups of those games. So strange. And now there won't be any Vita games in it or PS3 games. Do you think that Sony's ever going to walk down that handheld path ever again or do you think it's this is it it's done might be done i don't know i think um i actually don't really know internally especially in J in japan like if they consider that to be a success a sort of even or a failure um so i think for, it would be hard for me to say whether or not business-wise they think that there's a reason for it but considering how little they supported it, especially toward the end. I mean, never say never, I guess, but I think the way a lot of markets are moving is toward mobile. So having something like the Switch makes a lot of sense because it's sort of a hybrid. It kind of gets away with it. It's a very large handheld, but it, yes, is, it is, to <laughs> me, still a handheld. Um, but so, yeah, I think I just think the lines are blowing there. I don't know that they will. They made try to come out with better phones for gaming i have no idea yeah i'm i think i'm with you i don't think that there's a real reason why they would want to pursue another mobile device in the new era of smartphones and how the technology inside smartphones is so advanced these days and it just makes sense that, to dump that money into software development or into whatever's coming next for a PlayStation VR and, and PlayStation 5. That, to me, seems like the path to victory. But, Did you see the crazy folding phone today? Yeah, I was. Oh, I almost put it in the show notes, but I didn't. It's the Samsung Galaxy 10? Uh, something like that. It's also like $2,000. But when you just said that, it actually sparked in my head. I'm like, oh my God, if like PlayStation made a weird sort of similar thing where you could flip it out <laughs> and then have a bigger screen and then you'd have more room for, say, virtual buttons on the thing. That might be a more satisfying way to play a game on your phone. Yes. Well, to be clear, the Galaxy S10 is not the folding phone. It's uh, literally called Galaxy Fold. <laughs> oh, well, um, that's a very uh, <laughs> Yeah, and it's incredibly name. expensive. It says, yes. so over at CNET, uh, they wrote, it, with its new 7.3-inch Infinity Flex display, a 7nm processor, Samsung's new fast, solid-state storage, and seamless flow between folded and expanded views. The Galaxy Fold breaks new ground at $1,980. That applies to pricing, too. Oh, my God. It's Two, weird. It's a phone that folds into a tablet. It's, it's weird. I, I'm going to have to, like, look at some videos on it and be like, what the heck is this thing all about? But, yeah, I mean, why make a Vita when you've got a Galaxy Fold? When you can just fold it for two thousand dollars, this is gonna be weird, right? This is gonna flop, right? This is gonna be weird. I mean, I think the price alone means that's gonna, it's gonna. I don't want to say flop, but yeah. it might. I mean, like I, that's, people were bitching about the thousand dollar iPhone, which yeah, which I I bit the bullet and did it. I got the iPhone XS Max. Um, because I wanted the storage space and I use my phone for work and we're constantly uploading vlogs and photos and doing like actual work on our phones with digital video and, and other types of media. And so I was like, okay, I can justify this cost, but man, how does anybody else justify this cost? It's crazy. I don't know. <laughs> so 
Yeah, and I don't know. Let alone doubling that. Yeah, well, I mean, or a phone that's basically a tablet. It's weird. I don't understand. I don't quite understand it, but. Yeah, I also don't want to take a phone call on something that big. I mean, the XS Max is already huge. It's really, really large. I have to use both hands when I'm texting because I I have tiny baby hands, much like so you. So do I. Your hands are literally the only person's hands in my life that are, <laughs> I've ever found that are smaller than my hands. Um, yes. So, so it's, it's hard to hold already. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to do, I never got into like the Galaxy Note, the, you know, the much bigger one. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. We'll have to take you know, a, did you ever play or like screw around with the PSP go? No. Cause like to me, I'm like, honestly, the PlayStation could just go or Sony, I suppose I should say, uh, could make something similar. That's a phone, maybe not as curved. Well, they still and, have the Xperia, don't they? But does it have the slidey bit? I don't think so. So the PSP Go, if you are unfamiliar and you're like, what the fuck is that? It was basically if you could slide it out, you could slide out the controls. So like you could compact it and it would just be the front screen. Like a sidekick? Uh, You remember those? Yeah, honestly, (laughs) yes. It's basically a a PSP sidekick. Uh, Although the sidekick had the cool flippy, like the the way the screen would flip was really cool on the sidekick. It didn't do that on the PSP Go. It was just a straight, you just pushed it up see it tried to be cool and then it wasn't yeah but basically a sidekick but instead of buttons at the bottom it's a joy con it's like some like little, little joy nubbins nubs. yeah <laughs> listen if, if switch that. can do it <laughs> yeah why not man yeah exactly. let's make it happen well um to transition into the what i think is the final story um, it's, a, it's a doozy no, wait no there's two there's two or, there's two more stories um I want to remind people, I've said this publicly once, and I'll say it again in case you missed it. I'm going to be giving away my PlayStation Vita at our PAX East conference or panel in Boston. So if you want a chance to take home Andrew Renee's Vita, come to our panel in Boston. I feel like mine must still be, must have still been with Greg. I assume he got rid of it. No, remember, we gave it away to one of our fantastic care package patrons. Okay, that's right. I forgot. It has a new home. I did. It got regifted. Yes. I forgot about that because I have the memory of a goldfish. Out there, joy. I hope it's not in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it. You know what? It might be. That's okay. Um. Okay. So, um, let's move on so we can wrap up the news. We have a couple more stories. Um, more Anthem Day One fixes revealed. So this story is a little bit of a hot mess because the updates have been coming in on a rolling basis. And so by the time the podcast is out on Friday, there will have been an additional patch that has already been updated. I watched part of the stream that they did on Wednesday and they talked about a six gigabyte patch that they're pushing. They've also pushed several other hot fixes since the origin access premiere launch last Friday, the 15th. Um, so what they have said, so uh, PC Gamer did a little bit of a write-up. I'll just read what they wrote. Lead producer Mike Gamble detailed some of the improvements on Twitter over last weekend, including fixing various crashes, vanishing audio, and getting shot by invisible people. Bioware also <laughs> oh, that revealed- sounds terrible. Yeah, it sounds horrifying. Bioware revealed a more comprehensive list of changes among the general bug, fisc- bug fixes and tweaks being tackled by the day one update. It should also improve load times, sort out the infinite loading screens, and deal with more connection issues and clear clearly display gear modifiers responding to a comment on the patch notes on reddit a bioware developer noted that more patch notes are coming obviously (laughs) relating to gear and combat and those changes will also go live on february 22nd when anthem launches so i have a list here just for you to look at we're definitely not going to go through this gigantic list of anthem patch notes if you guys want to see the details please do head on on, over to the anthem website which you can get to from um, bioware's site um, but uh, Randbach Grimson writes in and says, Hey, ladies, I was a big fan of Destiny, but because I suffer from severe social anxiety, the game quickly became impossible for me to play. The lack of matchmaking and the raids, reliance on communication and puzzles made end game progress pretty much impossible unless I was willing to plug in a headset. For many people, that would be a great opportunity to meet some new friends. But unfortunately, verbal communication with strangers just wasn't in the cards for me then, nor is it now. My question is, having played Anthem and talked to the developers multiple times, do you believe this is a game a person can play without voice chat? 
Now, I know Bioware has said every activity will have matchmaking, which is great, but do you think the higher level stuff is going to be able to be completed without any verbal communication between me and all those scary randos on the internets? Aww. Uh, if the answer is no, please lie to me because I really want to play it. It's a PS. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So I think for me, it's going to be hard to say yes or no to this only because when we tried to play high-end content, we weren't we weren't leveled enough for it. We didn't have like the gear. We were kind of just jumped in to hot water yes. <laughs> being like, oops, we have no protection. Um, that being said, when what we were doing didn't, we didn't quite, we didn't really make it past anything that would require a lot of verbal communication. So I don't know what lies ahead. I imagine some communication would be somewhat necessary. Usually for end game content, it is in some way. Um, that being said, I think there's there's just emotes, isn't there? Yes, there are emotes. I haven't seen anything about like proximity chat or like team voice channels. I hope that that's something that they add um, if it's not currently available. As I was always playing in a party, I didn't attempt to talk to anybody else, but I don't think that's what he's asking here. No, I he wants to not actually speak at all, which I get. I think what actually might be interesting, and this is completely talking out of my ass speculation, but... Um, with Apex Legends, they did a lot of stuff with their ping system so that you don't necessarily need to talk to people. I do wonder if people like, you know, developers at Anthem, I have to imagine they are, are looking at those types of systems and wondering how they could implement it into end game content or not even end game content, any of the matchmaking content so that people who do get, you know, kind of social anxiety about, having to talk to someone on the internet, feeling like they might get bullied or just not wanting to deal with it can still have a good time in their game without needing to worry about any of the bullshit that comes with voice chat. Right. I think so. I, and every time I've spoken to the development team, which has been several times now, they've said that you can play this game without ever talking to somebody again. You will need to matchmake, obviously, because some of it is compulsory, but you don't need to be on headset because these aren't the same as raids in Destiny, for example, where you have to communicate in certain sections of the raid. Otherwise, you don't know who's going for which part of the puzzles. Um, from what we've seen of the stronghold so far, there really isn't a puzzle element that's super intense. Um, there's like some light puzzles that we've seen sprinkled throughout the world of Anthem, but we also don't know what their future endgame content is actually going to look like. So I would say feel confident that you're going to have dozens of hours of fun playtime in Anthem without ever needing to talk to anybody. And if you run into some snafus later on, once you get to deep end game content, you know, hop on over. That's to when the you yeah, come Discord. to our clan. Yeah. Um, or whatever it's called. <laughs> yeah, discord.gg slash what's good games. There's an Anthem channel that I've created. And so if you want to find some like-minded people that are willing to be nice to you and help you out, there are tons of great people in, in that chat. And that goes for anybody and everybody listening. Um, that if you are looking for people, we also have a specific LFG channel if you're specifically looking for something that isn't doesn't have its own dedicated channel. Because I can't make a channel for every game that comes out. No, that would be crazy. Channels. Um, anyway, I appreciate your question, but when it comes to all the issues that have been happening with Anthem, I've seen a lot of turmoil. Some people are having a great time and not having issues. Other people, they feel like the game is broken and that they've paid now for a broken game. And I think a lot of what's happening with this early access period with Origin Premiere and with EA Access is that we're echoing a lot of the concerns that we had during the VIP demo versus the open demo, right? The open beta or whatever. Like, does this feel VIP that you're playing it first and it's a hot garbage fire? Do you feel like your money was well spent playing it a week early or should you have waited until the actual day one patch lifted on day one? Is seven days too much? Is any amount of days too much? Steimer? Uh, honestly, yeah. As I was looking at people playing it last weekend... Pardon me. Someone was like, oh, don't you want to be playing it? And I was like, no, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to play this yet. It's not. This is not the date. There is a date on the calendar where that game is theoretically supposed to be ready for public consumption. And it is not that day. Like so. And I know like day one patches are so common now, especially with a service type game that Anthem is that I 
really dislike playing games like this early. I actually didn't technically want to even play the demo before. I was like, eh, I don't know. Cause like, I just want to go into it when it's live. Right. I just want to like jo jump in and enjoy. So I, I completely understand why people would feel shitty about their experience. Um, and I think it sucks too, that people are like technically reviewing it off of this state, uh, when it's not even out yet. Yeah, that's the really weird part because generally what we're seeing now when there's a multiplayer only game or an online only game that is clearly not available until launch day, we're getting reviews in progress or first impressions or reviews that come out like several days after the game has been live worldwide. And I would hope that most people would reserve judgment until then because um, – Clearly, the servers aren't where they need to be. The patches aren't where they need to be. But I can't let EA off the hook for this. You know, we talked. No, totally, yeah, yeah. We talked about it a lot on on, on Gamescast when I was on uh, last week, and it was really interesting hearing Fran talk about it because he's played more Anthem than anybody I know. I'm talking about Fran Mir Mirabella the Third. Um, he has a, a Twitch channel. If you guys want to check out his Anthem gameplay, uh, it's FM three underscore. He's played. At this point, over 50, maybe 60 hours of Anthem, which is wild to think about. Um, Get a job, Fran. Yeah, I know. That is his job now. <laughs> um, so I, I was really, I asked him a lot of questions because I was like, just don't spoil any story stuff for me. But I was like, oh, tell me about how it's been. Like, I'm really anxious to play. And, and he said, you know, like his biggest disappointment, despite the fact that he's clearly playing for his Twitch stream is that he was really sad that there wasn't that unified launch day excitement where everybody gets the game at the same time and we're all playing together and we get to have those water cooler moments where we're all in online forums discussing the game as a unified community. That it was so siloed with this very specific audience and then there was all this anger and frustration with all of the things that were wrong with the game and then people you know, not giving it a fair shake because you're seeing certain personalities talk about some of their issues with the game, whether that be load times, whether that be matchmaking, whether that be some story blocks or some way that they have managed the progression in the game. It's um, it's tough. It's, it's hard and I don't like it. And it was funny because I said that on the show and then someone tweeted to me and said, yeah, Andrea, but don't you get early access for games pretty much all the time anyway? Like, what's the difference? And that really made me take pause. I was like, that's true. I mean, I do get advanced access to a lot of games. But I think the primary difference between what's happening with Anthem and what happens with the bulk of video game reviewers is that we never talk about the game publicly, right? There's no secret video game reviewer forum where we're all like talking about the game behind everybody else's back. And it's been tough for me to have to avoid our Discord because I don't want to accidentally see stuff about Anthem, you know? There's Yeah, there's that. And then I think it's also um, whenever you're reviewing a game, normally if there is a day one patch or there's something coming, the developer or the public or whatever, or actually the PR rep, the developer's not really talking to you, uh, should it preface the code you have with, hey, these are the things that will be coming day one. So if the load times suck, they will be addressed day one patch, whatever, like certain things that you're prefaced with so that you have an understanding of what the final product should be. And then you can obviously verify that on day one. Um, but this is just a, a sort of a weird thing because kind of similar, even when they did the, the VIP demo, I was like, this just to me sort of is a weird marketing move that I'm sure they thought was a really good idea but it only is a good idea is if you're 100% solid on the code. Right. And, and you know that you're going to deliver a quote VIP experience. Otherwise don't call it that. I don't know what they, do you know what they called this early access window? Well, it was origin access premiere. And so you have to pay for a premiere subscription plus the price excuse me, the price of the game on top of that. So you're paying mm -hmm. probably like, I think Fran said he paid $100 in order to be playing early in the in the early code. Um, and it's like, it's one of those things that's like, I agree with you, Steimer, a lot that the messaging is super important and they whiffed it. I, yeah. I mean, 
down to the memes about the spreadsheets about how to play Anthem on a variety of different platforms and what you get. It's like, I would hope that by now publishers will have learned that, you know, a lot of gamers don't want or need all those bells and whistles. If you want to have digital content that's add-on, put it in the game as a microtransaction. We'll buy it then. But like gating content from pre-orders is just exhausting, you know? And it's, it's, I, I, it's a practice that I've been very conflicted about conflicted about over the course of my career because clearly I worked for GameStop TV for many years where we were pushing those exact pre-orders with digital items all the time. It was literally my job to do that. And I was of the mindset that, hey, if you're if you know you're gonna buy this game, if you know you're gonna buy Resident Evil 2, the remake, right? If you know you're Britney and you're obsessed with this game. I mean, and you get something special by pre-ordering it, like she got the deluxe edition with like a special gun and a special costume, I think. Um then go for it. There's literally nobody stopping you from saying, I don't want this. You know, like it's just an option. It's all about player choice. But when it comes to gating access behind a paywall or for pre-orders to the same content that everybody else is getting, then it gets a little bit stickier for me. And I haven't quite sussed out exactly how I feel about it because there's so many different shades of gray of like the different types of marketing shenanigans that's happening now. Well, I mean, this is Literally, though, similar to what Dreams is going to do, you are going to pay me money. You are going to get a tool. It is probably going to be broken well, a little bit. Well, not the key difference, though, is that they're saying it's early access. That's that's what I'm saying. That's I'm not saying what, what I'm saying, did. or what I'm trying to communicate is that a lot of it is in the messaging, and it is right. in how you are able to frame expectations for players. Because when you tell me that I have Origin Premier access and I'm paying you a bunch of money for it, I am expecting a certain level of quality with that. This isn't, you know, the, and so I think that that's kind of where they ran a, f a foot of themselves. They shot themselves yeah. in the foot a little bit. Yes, uh, I'm with you. And I think, honestly, it's interesting to watch EA marketing only because I once upon a time used to work there, but at this point it's been... Pff, <laughs> I don't even know how many years. How many years? A lot of years. How many years? A long time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and to me, it's like, oh, it doesn't feel like they've evolved a lot. It feels similar to how games were very much marketed uh, four or five years ago. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. Oh, this is more of like an EA story point, but I think it's interesting how Apex Legends came out because they basically shirked EA marketing. They said, we're going to do it. And they did it and they fucking nailed it. <laughs> so yeah, like, they really did. Uh, so I actually, I've just, I just found it to be an interesting data point that like <laughs> poor Anthem, I still obviously as a Bioware fangirl, as someone who um, technically worked for Bioware, again, that was like oh, the hell years ago. I can't even count. <laughs> um, but I clearly am biased in this regard and I want this game to do well because I really love the people there and I, I don't know. I want it to be good. Damn it. Right. I know. <laughs> like, I think we all do. Right. I think we're all gunning for it. We wanted to succeed and do well. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, for me, it's, it's one of those things where I just wish they had had a better team that was able to really frame expectations and not try to overhype a thing that maybe shouldn't be overhyped. Like you really need to know, what you're delivering to a player in order to know how to market it. Like, all right, real talk devs, how good is this demo going to be? And if they're like, yo, we locked that code in December and so many changes have been happening. Like maybe don't do that. They, like, you have to listen to them. Yeah. Well, well, anyways, rip. <laughs> it's launch, it's launch day today. So let's all cross our fingers that, they are able to work out some kinks as quickly as possible and that um, once we all get our hands on it and we'll have impressions for you next week that they will be good ones. So This giant list of patch notes you have here, which we're not going to read because good God. Um, is that for today or is this all day one patch? This is in the day one patch. Got it. Okay, cool. They have been doing some smaller patches. Hot fixes. Yeah, along the way. But this is like the the six gigabyte patch that you have to install on day one. Got it. And yeah, I imagine I mean, they're going to continue to add to these patch notes in the few days that are left. 
Before totally. Launch. If you are a player that like doesn't need to be day one, I would say hold off a little bit on Anthem. It's one of those yeah. games that's just going to get better over time. Exactly. I would say even like 60 days from now when they launch the first like post launch content, maybe even in March when they launch the first, uh, I think that's actually when the first post launch thing is coming. That would might even be a better time to to wait and get in because I know a lot of people in both the Facebook group and in the discord are like, Oh my gosh, do I do the division two or do I do Anthem? Um, I don't know. Do you want to be Iron Man or do you wear a parka? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to wear a parka? No, I'm just kidding. No, There's no more, I mean, I'm sure there are parkas, but there are, uh, Julian confirmed to me, uh, not yeah. to be reductive. Um, Brittany are actually going to go see a little bit more of the division two this weekend. Ah, very excited. But again, I'm like, I just want the game. Yeah. I don't want to see teasers of it. Yeah. Well, normally we probably wouldn't do additional coverage, but there was a lot of questions that went unanswered in my interview that I did with Julian because of time constraints. And so I think we're going to get a little bit more time. So if you guys have questions about the division, let me know. Um, all I right. Think I had some and I forgot what they were already. Well, we'll, so I'll try we'll pop all this you. weekend. Yeah. Um, let me just read this last story really quickly so we can take our first break of the show. Um, PUBG Mobile welcomes zombies in Resident Evil 2 crossover. So uh, this write-up comes from Shaq News. If you've been enjoying your Battle Royale fix on the go, your experience is about to get a dose of fear. If you, the newly announced crossover PUBG Mobile will meet Resident Evil 2 for an entirely new mode called Zombie Survive Till Dom. It's the culmination of the Resident Evil 2 cross-branding partnership that was announced at the PUBG Mobile Star Challenge 2017 Global Finals. Human players will face off against creatures that get more dangerous as the sun goes down. The mode features three days and two nights in a 30-minute round, dropping 60 players into the Battle Royale match with a twist. As they fight to be the last human standing player, they will have to fight off various zombies like the police zombie, Lickers, and G1 along with others. And yes, Mr. X is in the game. Oh my god. <laughs> Not only will the standard zombies become enraged, but special enemies like tyrants will also randomly spawn during the nighttime. Along with this new mode comes Leon and Claire skin sets and costumes for Ada and Marvin. The PUBG Mobile 0.11.0 update is available now and includes the Resident Evil 2 crossover mode. Grab your nearest mobile device and see if you can survive the battle royale. Um, so Probably not. Yeah, no, I... I heard this and I was like, I have to read this purely because Brittany would want us to talk about it if she were here because she's obsessed with the Resident Evil 2. And I know full well that she would have no desire to play PUBG, but she will definitely download PUBG mobile just to play this mode. Um, and I hope that she has downloaded it wherever you are in Hawaii right now, Brittany. <laughs> well, you're back. Oh my God. By the time the podcast airs, she'll be back. Um, and we'll talk to her about her experience on the show next week. But... I thought this is set a really cool crossover. This is something that would get me to boot up PUBG on my PlayStation or on but my Xbox. But this is just for, I'm confused because they keep talking about mobile. Is this only in mobile? It's just for the mobile version. Huh. And that's a bummer. I'm like, why? This such a, sounds so cool. It must have to do with the way that they've optimized the gameplay because clearly developing purely for mobile is completely different than for multi-platform. But I was like, dang bummer yeah but i i think it's a really interesting partnership but i guess i'm curious because i don't know obviously Fortnite kind of took its lunch but i wonder what the if like if are there just more people on mobile is that why they would choose to do this partnership there or i i don't know what their player base looks like right now in terms of the breakdown on console versus pc versus mobile that's a good question i think perhaps let me go down theory lane here for a second maybe capcom or one of capcom's partners was working on a mobile resident evil 2 like companion game because that mm. seems to be very popular these days and then they had some kind of meeting with PUBG, or maybe one of capcom's licensing people or marketing partnership people or whatever had some kind of meeting with one of PUBG's people Maybe they're having cocktails at one of these trade shows that we always go to all the time. They're like, hey, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on this. What are you working on? I'm working on this. And they're like, what if we teamed up and worked together on this? And then Capcom was like, you know what? We didn't really want to finish spending all that money doing a standalone mobile game anyway. Why don't we just do a crossover with PUBG and make it a brand new PUBG mode? Because clearly this is a standalone mode. It's not in PUBG. Yeah. 
Yep. It's just a theory. Survive till dawn. Have no idea if this is, if that's true or not, but. I mean, who's to say? <laughs> Someone knows, but it's not us. It's not us. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that's going to do it for the news this week. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what we've been playing. Stick with us. We'll see you in a minute. What's good, everybody, and welcome back to the second segment of the What's Good Games podcast, where we talk to you about what we've been playing. And this week's hands-on impressions are brought to you by Me Undies. Steimer. Yeah. Do you have some details for me about Me Undies? Oh, I sure do. <laughs> so, <laughs> everyone listening, ask yourself this one very important question: Is your underwear making you happy at this very moment, or were you not even thinking about your underwear? Wouldn't you like to be wearing underwear that is so soft that you feel like you're making love to an actual cloud all day long? Well, I've got one word for you, me undies. I'm actually wearing a pair right now. Hmm. BuzzFeed said this about me undies, quote, they feel like actual heaven against your skin. We're going to assume heaven is really soft in this context. <laughs> Ask Men said that they feel like silk drenched in hand lotion. And they are so soft that Kenny G thinks about them to get inspired to write his next song. Amazing. Me Undies uses the coveted micromodal fabric, which is a full three times softer than cotton. Take that, big cotton. <laughs> Not only will you feel like your loins are being hugged by joy itself, but Me Undies gives you multiple style options for both men and women. Choose between classic colors to adventurous prints, prints like significant otters, which sounds adorable, plant babies, and shamrocks. Speaking of prints, why not match your bottom half with your better half and get matching prints for both you and your partner? MeUndies is also the go-to for the softest loungewear this side of the Mississippi. Hang out in their super comfy lounge pants and onesies. Yup, MeUndies makes onesies, and they're incredible. MeUndies has a great offer for our listeners, so for any first-time purchasers, when you order MeUndies, you will get 15% off and free shipping. So this is pretty much a no-brainer. You get 15% off a pair of the most comfortable undies you will ever put on. And so to get this 15% off your first pair, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash WGG. That is MeUndies.com slash WGG. The Significant Otters print is adorable. And that shamrock print you can do in men's and women's matching just in time for St. Patrick's Day. Nice. Just an FYI. If you've been waiting to pull the trigger on MeUndies, now is the time. I've got 50%. the hearts that they did for Valentine's Day. Ooh, I love that one. Yeah, they're they super are cute. really soft. We'll have to think of something very clever to say in the next time. We'll be like, what's good game says they're as soft as something really clever. We'll think of it. <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah, we will. We will we'll, we'll work on it. We'll, we'll let you know. <laughs> exactly. All right. So um, in the show notes here, I have that Brit has been playing in the sand which I yeah. don't know if it's true or not. She might have been playing um, by the pool. So I'm not trying to show you my manicure. I'm trying to get my <laughs> my camera to pop back into focus. So fancy. Mine are just gray. <laughs> I like it, though. It's a very classic color. It goes with everything. Yes. Um, so you finished Crackdown 3. I did. Um, before you give me your final impressions, um, I've been really interested to ask you. I mean, I listened to you talk about it on the show last week. But do you think that this negativity around it is overblown? I mean, I think that I could definitely. For me, it's hard to say because I am a, a biased opinion. I love Crackdown. I have very fond memories. I have a lot of nostalgia tied to this genre, not genre, this uh, franchise. And for me, I knew exactly what I had the exact correct expectations for this game. So I was not disappointed and I really enjoyed it. But I, I could definitely see how if you weren't quite sure what Crackdown was or when you are trying to, I think a lot of it t gets tied up, though, in the console wars, which I still can't believe is still a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and whenever people are trying to compare Microsoft's current lineup of exclusives with anything that PlayStation has done recently. And sure, Crackdown is not The Last of Us. It's not Spider-Man. It's not any of those things. And to me, I wouldn't personally try to make those comparisons, but I can see why people would. And I just mostly, I guess, feel bad for the developers because like, they made a Crackdown game, and they made a good Crackdown game. 
but not everyone's going to enjoy this. I think the production value is what a lot of people were probably disappointed with. Um, I don't know how many people are super keen on the art style. I, again, I know that art style cause it's the same from yeah. before. So it's cohesive. Yeah. It's a, yes, it's the through line through all three of those crackdown games. But I don't know. To me, Crackdown has always been a sort of summer movie flick, right? Where you're just like, oh, this is fun. And I eat popcorn and I drink my soda and I'm not thinking too hard about anything. I'm just running around shooting shit and blowing things up and orbs, tasty orbs come to me. And then I level up and I'm like, Rah! and it's great. <laughs> that's, that's to me what Crackdown is. It's a very like guttural, visceral reaction. Um, but if you are someone who's like, man, I really love... Um, I don't even know what to, what to necessarily call them. Like Spider-Man, all of the like the Sony games definitely have more of a narrative to them. Not to say Crackdown doesn't. It's just not the reason why you would play Crackdown. It's not a triple A. Yeah. It and, that, and I think that's the concerning part for some people because did we get a final read on what the retail price was? I don't know. Here's why it doesn't matter. It's in Game Pass. Just go yeah. get Game Pass. Like, True. I think, I think personally, I would probably have a harder time with this game, um, and recommending it to everyone if it wasn't in game pass. Yeah. Cause yeah, like $60 is a lot of money. Obvi I work, I pay my own bills. I pay all for all of this shit. And it's like 60 bucks is a lot. You pay my so telephone bills. I understand you pay my automobiles. <laughs> Sorry. I just immediately, I just immediately thought Destiny's Child. <laughs> I mean, yes, very much a little bit of that. Um, but so, so I definitely understand how it can be hard to stomach, but since it's in game pass and game pass is $10 a month. And I think right now is $2 like that's yes. It's a no brainer. It's worth, it's worth $10. It's worth $2 for sure. Like you can definitely, and it's not one of those games where like you can definitely just finish this game. And if you wanted to like bounce out of game pass, it's a thing you could do. It's interesting because I feel like every major game that has come to Game Pass as an Xbox One exclusive, with the exception of Forza Horizon 4, has been this game that's like, Meh, I wouldn't pay for this at retail, but I'll buy it on Game Pass. And I don't know how I feel about that because I appreciate what Xbox is doing with Game Pass. And I think that it's clearly a move to a subscription-based service that a lot of publishers are exploring right now. Obviously, look at Origin Access Premiere with Anthem. But it's hard to argue against people who are saying, well, I can buy Spider-Man for PS4 for $59.99, or I can buy Crackdown 3 for Xbox One for $59.99. And those are not apples and oranges when it comes to quality of games, the amount of content that you can play, and just overall game design, right? And it's... But we... I would go back to saying, yeah, but we knew that this was going to be the thing for the, at least for the time being until, you know, we got that amazing slate of studios that Xbox has acquired back at E3, those games, which are going to elevate the next generation of Xbox, aren't going to be ready for a couple of years at best. And so right yeah, now, that's, and that's kind of aggressive depending yeah. on whether or not they are making new IP, like right. building from scratch lore and all of that shit. Cause that takes years. Right. And so I would say I'm with you that I think the game is being rightly critiqued as a retail launch. And I, if Microsoft had just said this is going to be an Xbox Game Pass exclusive where you can only buy it on game or you can only play it. But if you buy a Game Pass subscription and then they added additional like microtransactions in the game to help fund development, whether it be skins or special orbs or what have you whatever would make sense that wasn't paid just to more terry cruz yeah right i mean like <laughs> if they had just done that i think it might might have been a much more successful launch for them they might not have even needed to do a retail release at all but it's i hope that they did a smaller retail release I, but that being said i literally so i had one crackdown tweet blow up a little bit and uh people were, were tweeting at me like they're retail copies. Like people are buying this retail. Now, I don't know why. I assume it has to do with preferring having a physical box over, over something digital, um, which I understand for things like books. I'm that way 
people are like, get a Kindle. I'm like, no, I had a Kindle once and I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I want the book. So I, I do get that. Um, but obviously you're, you're sort of, if you're doing that, you are a crackdown fan and you're mostly doing it to support the developers versus being like, Oh, for value, which one of these two things is the thing I want to pay for. Right. Uh, I think, and I, I hope that it's a, a more conscious choice for those people. And cause you can easily get this game for $10 right now, or again, it might still be $2 depending on, they had an offer going. Um, I think what I'm interested to see with game pass, cause to your point of like everything they've released in so far has sort of been like, besides Forza has been a little bit, I mean, not quite ready, I guess is what I would say. Yeah. It, like, and, look at Sea of Thieves now versus when it launched last year. You know, it's like yep. night and day with that game. Totally. And I think what I will be curious to see is how they could possibly sustain when their actual AAA starts coming out, like Halo. And then you're telling me that you're going to put that in something that's $10 a month. First, I, I, to me, it's just, again, somebody smarter than me has crunched these numbers. They have figured it out. I fucking hope. Yeah, but, well, they, there was actually a story that came out. I think it was over the weekend last weekend. Uh, let me just do a quick Google search here. Um, um, well, this is. Um, hmm. I'm not I'm not seeing it come up right away. I thought that they talked about it on games daily uh, how it was being really successful but the game pass mm-hmm. yeah i mean I, I, how it like I'm increased not... the amount of p games that people are buying and their overall purchases went up if they were a game pass subscriber and that makes sense so basically game pass subscribers they hope to make into whales at some point or like people that are going to continue to purchase these things yeah that makes sense um, they also just announced that they're adding Alien Isolation and Epic Mickey 2 to the games for February in case anybody is interested. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um, it's certainly something that... Oh, here it is from Windows Central, the write-up. It says, Xbox Game Pass significantly increases game sales and playtime, says Microsoft. And the subscription, which is $9.99 per month, is doing rather well. Um, since the service launched, many gamers have been asking Microsoft... How many subscribers ha it has? And while usually the company doesn't comment on sales figures, during an interview between Microsoft's Executive Vice President of Gaming, Phil Spencer, and Level Up, the former revealed a general account. There are millions of subscribers already, he has said. So at $10 a month, millions, means they're making at least $10 million a month from this, which is pretty good. Um, let's see here. So the quote here for the stats that um, Microsoft gave are 20 percent increase in playtime with game pass subscribers 40 percent increase in the number of games played whenever new games enter game pass active players double 25 percent increase in pre-orders and 10 percent increase in franchise sales i mean interesting that's, that's hard to argue with yeah i'm curious to know how this will affect um npd though because uh, npd doesn't really track it take track it Mm. Um, and so I wonder if Microsoft's games will just naturally look like they're doing less, less successfully over, over time. Um, because they're, they're tying a lot of their things into a subscription service where you can no longer tie whether or not someone technically purchased it for that thing. Obviously there's correlation. If you buy it around the time a thing, a game comes out, you could naturally assume that that's why they're getting into it, but yeah, I, I, unless Microsoft is reporting their numbers directly to NPD, which they do sometimes. Um, so we'll see. Maybe. But I'm saying like I'm saying for Game Pass, you could not just bundle it for Crackdown, for instance. You couldn't be like all of those millions of players who have Game Pass now count for my NPD numbers. No, totally. What I was saying is that Microsoft can see who is playing crackdown through game pass right like oh, they sure. have all that yeah. data so they could technically go back to because they i remember them <laughs> talking a, a lot about game pass players on sea of thieves and game pass players for state of decay 2 so they can say you know we have three million people playing crackdown 3 on xbox game pass and i just pulled that number out of a hat that's not a real number um right. but for example Yes. But yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. They could do that. Something to ponder for sure. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a game 
that I've been playing called Tetris 99. Oh my goodness gracious. Have you downloaded this yet? It's no. free. It's free, you know. If you have I do know it's free, if but you have it sounds like a subscription. Uh, you know what? I find Tetris stressful enough to begin with, <laughs> let alone having a bunch of other people trying to fuck me up. Um, Agreed. After my very brief stint with Tetris 99, I'm like, I don't know if this is for me because I like the idea, the competitive aspect of me is like, oh, I want to show people how good I am at puzzle games. But the randomness of it and how you get targeted and the way that the... Uh, people send over blocks that stack up underneath your puzzle pieces. I'm just like, ah, I don't know how I feel about this. But yeah. I, to I, be clear, also to rewind a little bit, if you have no idea what Tetris 99 is, yes, it is Tetris. But um, Battle Royale. I, you can you can probably <laughs> it is and it isn't right. It's just basically a weird competitive. I mean, I guess I don't know. It's a weird use of that term because there's yes. no map and it basically is just everybody. It's musical chairs of Tetris. It's almost a better way to describe it, actually, now that I, I mention it. So if you guys haven't seen any gameplay of it, essentially your puzzle box is in the very middle of the screen. And on each side of the screen, there are like 40 plus other little tiny boxes of all of the people that you're playing against where you're like dropping in with, right? Also, all of the memes about Tetraminos dropping and people being like, where are we dropping, boys? Really made me smile. That um, was cute. <laughs> And so there's a couple different pieces of gameplay that are different than the traditional Tetris, you know, puzzle building. And one of those is that you can see where everybody else is at in their puzzle uh, by just like moving one of your joysticks over or you can specifically target them. So as you clear lines, you get bonuses that you can then use to direct attacks to try to take out other players. And clearly, as it gets lower and lower in the amount of players that are left, the speed of the Tetraminos dropping increases to make it more stressful. And then people send over these lines of Tetraminos that build up underneath the building blocks that you're already doing. And it's stressful because you don't know how many people are targeting you at the same time. Like, you get some audio cues and things like that. But what I found was there was just way too much happening on screen for me to be able to focus on anything other than the Tetraminos dropping. And I just don't think that this is going to be a game for me because I would much rather be spending my time in Tetris Effect, listening to that gorgeous soundtrack and looking at those beautiful visual effects, playing by myself and maybe competing against my friends on the leaderboard, but not actively being targeted because I felt like so many of the attacks were random where I would be doing really well, feeling really good about myself, and then all of a sudden, bloop, 10 lines of Tetraminos underneath. And I'm like, there's no way I can come back from this. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm screwed here. Yeah, it's it, anytime I saw like, gameplay of it or anything, for me, I'm like, this is too much to pay attention to for me. I don't know that I can multitask on this level. Because, uh, like, I just worrying about the one board is enough. And now I have to sort of be paying attention to what other people are doing and then figuring out who to target. So who's doing well and then trying to screw them up to knock them out. Like, oof. yeah, if you if you are super into this game, like hats off to you. Yeah, it's I'm glad I tried it so I can see what all the hype was about. But I, this is not something that I'm going to continue playing. It's too stressful. Um, speaking of stressful, Metro Exodus. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. I'm glad that Brittany talked about it and that she's been playing it. Um, I have been really loving the game. I'm not quite finished with it yet. I'm finally into Autumn, which I believe is the final season. I spoke about this on Gamescast, and I said I was in summer, and I thought that was the final season, and that was wrong. Um, but <clears throat> one of the things that I, I'm glad, you know, Brittany was having some fun with was, you know, the more spooky, scary thriller parts of the game, the more dungeon-like experiences, the linear levels that Metro is really known for. It's been interesting seeing how they've handled the open world elements in the game for each different season. They've been quite dramatically different. Like summer's season, for example, well, not summer, spring in the Caspian Sea was much larger than summer, for example. And it made me think, oh, well, maybe I should have spent more time doing more exploring to really see, you know, what everything was happening in the world. Because I realized once you 
activate a certain story mission on the critical path, you can't go backwards. It's done. And that's kind of a bummer. So I would say to you guys, if you have been playing Metro, if you're interested in playing Metro Exodus, just to keep that in mind that you should do as much exploring as you would like to do before you hit all the story missions. Because once you hit that one, there's no going back. Um, is this something you're going to play at all, Steimer? Or is it, are you like, nah, not on my radar? It's not really, it's not for me. No, when I played it, especially when I played it at that one event, I thought maybe I'd be interested in it, but man, just, just fucking bleak. <laughs> like, yeah. Just... Well, I, I think what, the, what I love about what they're doing with Metro Exodus is that they're really putting a human face on it more so than they've done in the past. And clearly this is based off of a narrative book series. So they're bringing in a lot of those storylines, but clearly making them their own for the video game. And I like how there's downtime in certain parts of the game world where you can explore the Aurora, which is the train that you're taking across Russia, where you get to have these intimate moments with different members of the crew. For example, there's a, a guy named Stepan who helps you rescue another character in the game. And Stepan and this new character form a relationship. You kind of get to see watch from the wings as this guy who's clearly been isolated underground in the metro just trying to survive finally has you know a human interaction that has something meaningful to him and some emotion behind it whereas most of the guys in your crew are spartan rangers they're military guys they're there to you know execute their mission to find out what's happening with the great war the whole reason why there's nuclear fallout in the first place and you know, you're following the colonel on this mission to figure out like what happened to the people in charge of the war is the war still going on even and really seeing these the these individual men on your team and how they relate to RTM has been something that I've really enjoyed with Metro Exodus that I didn't get as much of as I would have liked in the previous games in the series. And of course, RTM's relationship with Anna, his wife, was, you know, a fledgling relationship in the last game and now is full on marriage in this game and kind of seeing their conversations, their quiet, private conversations about what if it was just us? Where would we go? Like, what would we do of, you know, in this post-apocalyptic world where we have a cottage and a forest, we'd go to a beach or... You would fucking die because the <laughs> goddamn monster would come and eat you. Or that, you know, <laughs> Steimer bringing me back to reality. <laughs> I, this is the game where you asked me what I would do if I was in it and I said I would kill myself. <laughs> and like, that's not... I don't take that lightly. Like the idea of doing that or trying to actually commit suicide is terrifying. But in that world, I think I'd have to do it. <laughs> like, I just don't know that I could deal. I don't blame you. Post-apocalyptic settings are stressful in their own ways, as, as Tetris 99 is too. <laughs> but I think it's more, the, it's more the fact that it's not just post-apocalyptic, because obviously I really enjoy the Fallout series. It's right. more that it's that coupled with I think sort of like survival thriller ish is kind of what you would call it. Right. Um, and that things are scarce and it's hard. Like when you let me play, I had no bull. I had nothing. Yeah. I was just like run away, I guess from well, everything. They also didn't let us play on the lowest difficulty setting during that demo. And I played the first two seasons on normal mode just to like get a baseline feel for the way the developers intended for the game to be played and to really see the survival mechanics in action. And then I was like, okay, I've, uh, I've done, I've done my due diligence. I've played enough of the game and now I'm dropping it down to baby ass baby mode and, and never looked back. Now that's not to say that there hasn't been moments where I've run out of certain kinds of ammo, but certainly much less stressful now where I'm not having to really make as thoughtful choices. So if I want to like spray some bullets, I can and I can get away with it, but you still have to scavenge and find crafting materials and be monitoring, you know, the day and night cycle and monitoring your air filters. I mean, they, they've given you a lot of tools to make the game more approachable if that style of gameplay isn't your cup of tea. And I appreciate that they did that. And then on the other side, if you're like, yo, I want a challenge, I want to see just how hard mode I can go they have a really high-end difficulty where all the resources are super scarce and you don't soak hardly any damage and the HUD is like not visible at all and all that so but I'm with you I understand yeah it's just gonna be a it's gonna be a harder sell for me but 
That being said, are you wait, are you done talking about it? Because I'm going to make a smooth ass transition here. Oh, the one last thing I wanted to mention was. All right, transition ruined. So I'm sorry about your smooth ass okay. transition. I just have to say because it's something that I don't think Britt touched on too much, but there's a lot of narrative choices that come from your actions in the game. There's always been consequences to your actions in the world of Metro throughout the history of the franchise. There's been multiple endings. And that's no different. In fact, I would say the stakes are maybe a little bit higher this time around in Metro Exodus. And so every time I complete a critical path mission where someone's life is on the line, because you can lose your teammates in this game and not get them back, a la Mass Effect. Um, and I always have like a little victory being like, yeah, that person survived. Hooray. Um, <laughs> I did it. But yeah, I, I'm excited to see how my story is going to play out. I can kind of see some things being telegraphed now that are going to make me probably really sad about certain characters. And I'm just like, please, no, don't let something bad happen to them. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to fi finish the game. And um, and yeah, it's been going well. That's all I have to cool. say. Nice. I ruined your transition. I'm sorry. A little, a little bit. Because I was going to say, but speaking of games I didn't think I would enjoy, Far Cry New Dawn. Now, ah. here's the thing. I can't overly say that I like love it yet. I haven't played enough. But what I have played, I'm like, oh, I actually kind of dig this. <laughs> and yes, I'm well aware of the fact that I have shit talked to this game. <laughs> so <laughs> don't at me. I already know. I'm self-aware, if nothing else. <laughs> uh, it's, it was interesting, actually, because I kind of just was like, oh, well, I, I mean, and th uh, Ubisoft did provide me a code. So I was like, I have literally nothing to lose. I finished Crackdown. So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and hop into this, see what it's about. I actually dig the aesthetics way more than um, Far Cry, the yeah, other Far Cry. Yeah, me too. OG Far Cry. I like the pink flowers everywhere. I'm into it. The water's really, the sky is beautiful. The sky looks like, um, uh, I keep wanting to say Aurora Lights, but that's not technically what they're called. Uh, Northern Borealis, Lights. That's, yeah. Uh, and it looks like constantly like that. The water is this very interesting shade of blue. Basically, we should nuke everything because it looks so pretty. <laughs> Like, come on, if you're telling me that this is what it looks like after, 17 years after, God, it's like really nice looking. <laughs> and I don't have to wear a mask or anything. I apparently can go in the water and not die. Like, what are the downfalls? I don't know. Oh uh, obviously, everything's blown to shit, but <laughs> we have we have rebuilt. Um, I think what I am most excited for, because Brittany kind of explained a bunch of the mechanics of it last week. Uh, I do like that they've sort of simplified a few of them and uh, it's all just really about your components and the gears that you're grabbing in order to craft things at Prosperity. Yes, that is the name of the main town or the main, your hub. And um, what I'm looking forward to more though is when I kind of get to the weirder shit as you unlock different levels of Prosperity. So right now, I feel a bit basic. Like, they give you the first gun to craft and it's the stealth saw gun where you just shoot out little blades and it bounces around people. I hate that. And gun. I literally <laughs> said out loud, Oh fuck. Yeah. I was just like, Oh yes, this is fun. <laughs> I enjoy this very much. Give me more weird shit. I want your weird apocalyptic guns. I don't want your boring basic bitch handgun. I don't want it. It's boring. It's stupid. <laughs> like if you're going to go apocalyptic, go apocalyptic. Let's go. Uh, Anyway, so, but it does look like a lot of the later guns are kind of more in that vein, at least design-wise. I have no idea how they fire because I have not unlocked them yet. Uh, but you can bet your sweet ass I will once I get to that point. Yeah. Because that, that is what I, I really enjoy sort of offshoots like this when they do lean super heavy into it. And they're like, you know what? Just, I don't know. Build a gun that shoots potatoes. I don't know. Who cares? Build <laughs> like, a gun will... that shoots potatoes. Uh, what do you think about the twins? I haven't gotten too much of them. I've mostly been running around doing other things. Uh, I've been exploring. I've been collecting a whole bunch of uh, your your bros, your brosifs, people who are either your companions or I mostly just leave them at camp. The guns for uh, hire? Yeah. But then... I just got the next good old boy, Little Timber, who's a good pupper, and he's so cute. And I'm like, oh, my God, now they're they're pitting Boomer against Timber. What am I going to do? <laughs> oh, Boomer's Which gone. One's... 
What? To your I know gone. I know Boomer is gone. But his spirit lives on in Timber. That's good. Uh, and Timber just looks so soft and cuddly. <laughs> I'm basically immediately switched from Carmina, uh, who is like the, the first person you get, to Timber. Because I was like, I love the animal companions in Far Cry because they don't talk at me. <laughs> You There's, mentioned that when we were talking about uh, our preview time with uh, with New Dawn. You were like, are there animals that I can play with? And I was like, yes. Yes, because uh, the humans just bug, bug me. And actually, <laughs> I tweeted about it. Like, cause, granted, it's not that bad in Far Cry, but it is just a thing in general in video games where your friggin' companions get stuck in doorways and you're like, move, move, get, get out of there. <laughs> what are you doing? I need to leave. <laughs> and I was like, no. Nope, nope, nope. I'm trying yep. to find the uh, the text I sent to Brittany. Because <laughs> this, again, this is a very minor nitpick. But I thought it, it was funny and that people would enjoy it. I said, how the fuck do you deal listening to this bitch grunt while you run everywhere in Far Cry? <laughs> I was like, I've been playing for two hours and I'm going insane already. <laughs> so when you run, I don't feel like I noticed this this much in, far, like, in, the, uh, in last year's. But I feel like every time I'm running anywhere, I am just constantly gasping for breath in a really obnoxious way. And I wish that there was a toggle where I could just be like, I don't hear this audio anymore. Yeah, that's weird because there's not really a stamina system, right? There is a little bit. So it's part of the perks that you can um, upgrade oh, is yeah, your sprint like ability and your underwater. And mm, yeah. Okay. So it, it is, yes, a little bit. I've upgraded that once because I thought it would make it better. <laughs> I was like, uh, this might be a waste of points, but God damn, I can't Stop listen to this anymore. getting so breathless. And she still does it a lot. So it didn't help that much. Maybe the higher levels make it stop i don't know but right now i'm like i'm going crazy please stop breathing so heavily you just gotta start taking vehicles everywhere uh i never here's the i mean in far cry it's easier because you just put it on auto drive but yeah. honestly in open world games i tend to go on foot almost everywhere uh unless it's real far and then yes i'll just be like all right i get in the car now and i look on my phone while i put it on auto drive and yeah pray to god i don't crash into something or you can fast to travel family. too yeah yeah, fast travel is a thing. I also went ahead and I'm going to like unlock those perks at the camp because I just tend to use fast travel and then hoof it. Yeah, well, I guess when you're hoofing it, you can like get crafting materials and go hunting and all that stuff. There's, yeah, I just like the options of, I feel like you just get to explore a little bit more. You run across things you may not have if you were just driving in your car. Um, whenever supply drops come around, I think it's a little easier to go grab it. You're like, oh, it's over there. Cool. I shall go get this thing now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so far I'm enjoying it. I think I, I can't say for certain that I'm definitely going to beat it. Here's what I'm wor worried about. I'm worried I'm going to lose interest in this game the minute Joseph Seed comes back because they're already telegraphing it. They're like, oh, we've seen some follower. We've seen some weird shit around and I'm not even that far into the game. And I'm like, I don't want to see him again. <laughs> just I don't just. No. You're like, no, thanks. No. I'm good. Yeah, no, thank Pass, you. Hard pass. So, um, so again, that's not, not I don't think, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen because I have not finished this game, but I hope it's not too much of him. Yeah, I don't know. I have yet to start that game because I've been trying to, in the few days that I've been home since getting back from um, Australia and DICE, I've been just trying to finish Metro. So I've been kind of mainlining that. But... I did find sure. a little bit of time to play a game on my phone. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have other thoughts you would like to say about Far Cry New Dawn? Uh, I had a notebook over there. I realized it's over there, though. So, no, for now, I think it's fine. I, I think the... Yeah, I think I've said everything I'm going to say for now. I am. I will definitely keep you guys updated because I want to get farther in it. I want to unlock further things and prosperity and see... See what these crazy guns are that look neat, but who's to say? Yeah, I definitely want to play. It's just about like, when do I fit it in? Do I try to play it? <laughs> do, I know the pillow's so far away. I need to move it closer. Um, um, do I play it like while I'm trying to play Anthem? Do I wait until I've played Anthem for a couple of weeks and then go back to Far Cry before the division? I don't know. I have to think. I don't know. I'm hoping it won't be too terribly long. I don't think Brittany said it was that bad. Um, yeah, she's finished so, it already, right? 
Yes. So it can't be more maybe, than like... or she was close. I don't okay. remember if she'd finished or was just like decently far along. Got it. All right. Well, I will um, look forward to your future updates. Yes. Also, I don't know entirely. Like, I think they have fixed the way story missions work, but again, don't actually haven't gone too far in to really figure that out yet. I'm assuming other reviews would tell you, but I think one of the things that pissed me off the most about last year's Far Cry was the way it would just grab you and like no matter what you were doing, it was like, nope, you're in the story mission now. You're like, cool. I what? No, I don't want. I don't want to do this right now. Yeah. Anyways, that I do not find that so far to be the case in New Dawn. Which Maybe I they heard the complaints and were like, you know what? We're just they just gonna, listened to this podcast. We're just going to leave <laughs> that out this time around. Maybe that was, you know, it was an experiment. We tried it. Maybe, maybe not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I want to just briefly talk about Kingdom Rush Vengeance. So this is a game that actually came out at the end of last year. And I just kind of missed it in the whirlwind of everything that was happening at the end of the year. And I am so glad that I remember that I bought this game and started playing it. So Kingdom Rush is a fantastic mobile franchise that's all about fantastically executed tower defense gameplay. And they've built in some really fun little RPG mechanics into the game. And Kingdom Rush Vengeance is the fourth installment in the franchise and it's everything you could ever want in a kingdom rush game and more it's only five bucks uh in the apple app store or in the google play android store and if you like tower defense and you've played any of the kingdom rush games before from ironhide games then you absolutely should get this game. I love playing it on airplanes. It used to be my go-to airplane franchise because I would play it on my iPad before my Nintendo Switch became a thing. And I was super excited to hear that they were working on another installment in this franchise because I played the crap out of the last three games and I've three starred all the levels and I've got all the heroes and there's just really not much left to, for me to do unless I want to play in the super nightmare difficulty. And I'm like, no, nah, that seems like it's not actually going to be that fun. Um, <laughs> so, so, no, thanks, Pat. <laughs> um, so I'm really glad that this new game came out, but they've got this really cute little comic book art style that they do. And there's so many different unique levels to play. And there's a bunch of different challenges for each level and they've incorporated an achievement system within the game where if you um, unlock specific achievements within the game, you get like a point system that you can then use those points to buy upgrades for your characters and for all of your different towers and things like that. So have you ever played any of the Kingdom Rush games? I have not. Well, if you enjoy tower defense, can I do, but I don't anymore. know if it's on the same level that you do. Probably not. Tower defense <laughs> is one of my all-time favorite genres of all time like I really enjoy tower defense and there's a lot of good tower defense games that people have recommended to me over the years that I just haven't gotten around to because the thing about tower defense is that you really got to be patient and they take a long time and you can't really walk away from them in the middle because then you kind of lose where your strategy was at but I mean I guess you could technically I was also a big fan of monsters pixel junks game and I never spent enough time with monsters too which came out but I haven't played this. So I'm just in the early levels, but I just wanted to remind people, if you forgot about Kingdom Rush, go pick it up. It's available now. <laughs> You're like, it real good. It's good. It's good. Yeah. Game. Um, and I was asking you before the show, Steimer, what Glass Masquerade is. So Glass Masquerade um, just recently came to Switch. I believe, let me see when it was. It's on Steam already. Obviously, it's already on Switch as well because I've been playing it for a little bit. Um, but it is a puzzle game, but not like a video game puzzle game. It's literally jigsaw puzzles. So what you are doing in the game is you are, it's there, all of the puzzles, the jigsaw puzzles are clock faces and they're done in this really beautiful, like stained glass art deco style. Ooh, I just pulled up a gameplay trailer to watch while you're talking. Dude, it's so soothing. So I play this, I've been playing this every night before bed and it just really is nice to solve some puzzles like look at some beautiful art and then listen to really soothing music while you're doing it and it's just i've played my switch more for this 
I'm more inclined to go pick my switch up for this than I have been for anything a little while. I think just because it's, it's just such a beautiful little game and I enjoy the simplicity of it so much. Yeah, the art style is really well done. Uh, it's like the stained glass of all the different clock faces is really pretty. Yeah. The only thing that's sort of weird is it's uh, almost, it's basically twice as much on the Switch. So on Steam, it's five bucks, but on uh, Switch, it's, I think right now I just looked it up, it was like nine fifty nine. Does the Switch but... version have more levels? <sighs> Don't think so. Hmm. Uh, might just be cost more to like develop for this. I have no idea. Interesting. Um, but regardless, I really, I'm going to be sad when I run out of puzzles. Is there a way to go back and do the puzzles differently? You can do them again and try and do them faster. Uh, and there's also, so there's basically a semi assist mode. It's not really assist, but, um, well, I guess it kind of is. So in the beginning, if you can eliminate this help, if you want to, but I have it turned on, so it will highlight four to five pieces on the clock, depending on how hard the puzzle is. Uh, it might be more, it might be less. And it will showcase on the clock face different, like, just circles. And the highlighted pieces will be red. And you'll have to drag. You can basically, it gives you a head start, basically, is what it's doing. It's like, this puzzle piece is going to go in one of these four places. To sort of give you some boundaries to work within. Um, but you can turn that off. So then if you're like, no, no. I am Jigsaw Puzzle Master. <laughs> you can go through and do that. And you can you can replay all of the levels, um, which I'm sure that I will do at some point. Uh, and you can kind of try to, to just beat your time because it logs how long it's taken you to beat each puzzle. Some of them take me a while. I think the longest one took me like 25 minutes so far. That doesn't seem like that long. It is. It feels long when you're sitting there like, damn it, this shouldn't be that bad. <laughs> Because these aren't, they aren't ginormous puzzles. They're all clock faces. Oh, it looks like they announced a sequel. Oh, hell yeah. Glass Masquerade 2 Illusions. Yes, please. Available February 25th. Oh my God, my prayers have been answered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if it's coming to Switch on Nintendo. Or, it might not be on that. February yeah, it 25th. might not be on it's on Steam at least. Yeah, yeah. It says the. I, I'm just looking at Steam right now. Yeah, it says. A oh my god! Too. It's. There you go. I really, really, really like it. Um, because again, I I just dig the art style. I dig the music. It is the perfect before bed sort of sort of game. Or if just in any, if you're like, I'm stressed out, I want to play something. But a lot of games these days are stressful. <laughs> Ain't that the this, truth? <laughs> this is not. This is a nice break. It seems like a game I'd like on my phone, too. Can I have it on Switch and my phone? I don't generally Maybe. bring my Switch to bed because I leave it in the dock when I'm at home. I oh, I leave it on my room. nightstand table right now. See, that's... You could just move smart. your dock to your nightstand table. Uh, that would require me to have a television in the bedroom, which I have outlawed. Why would it... Isn't the... I mean, the dock is just... I mean, yes, you can dock it to your TV, but... It I guess just maybe just set up a power station, station for yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Oh, um, you know, I never thought about that. We do have an extra dock lying around. Oh my God! Perfect. See. Oh, set look it at up you, right Steimer, there. with all the bright ideas. <laughs> um. Well, this has been fascinating. I never would have thought to check out Glass Masquerade before. So thank you for the recommendation. I enjoy a nice soothing puzzle game with beautiful artwork and nice relaxing music. That sounds. That sounds cool. Um, yeah. And now you have the sequel to look forward to. You I'm so know excited. It. Know it. It's funny because somebody in the Steam comments was like, why didn't they just bundle the old one with the new one for a Switch launch when the new one comes out? I'm like, that would have been genius. That would have been really good. It's not too late. They can still do it. <laughs> I'm sure Nintendo has certification you have not passed, but you could still do it. Yeah, that's probably right. That's probably true. Um, well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning into the show this week and being part of the What's Good Games family and our community. I uh, just want to give you guys another reminder that this weekend, so if you're listening to the podcast on Friday, tomorrow, February 23rd, is when all of our fantastic Patreon streams are going down. Again, that happy hour Q&A starting at 12 p.m. Pacific time and the after hours gameplay stream starting at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Again, patreon.com slash watch good games for all of those details and links that you're going to need. 
Don't forget to mark your calendars for March 16th for our Patreon update live stream. And of course, we'll be at PAX East on March 28th in the Bobcat Theater. Uh, all of this, of course, is on our social media channels and on our website. If you forget, but if you just happen to be at your computer and you have your calendar open, you want to like, you know, make a little reminder, go for it. We'd appreciate it. And as always, if you have not yet subscribed to the podcast, that helps us out so much, you guys, much more than you would think. Um, if you want to go one step further, if you can't support us on Patreon because of stuff happening in your life, that's okay. Maybe drop us a review in iTunes or in Google Play or head on over to YouTube and hit subscribe there. Or maybe just say something nice about us on the internet somewhere and let us know about it. That would make us feel good. I actually put out a link for testimonials for our new video that I'm going to be editing for our relaunch in March with the Patreon changes. Um, you can find that link uh, on our Patreon page or in the Facebook fan page, and we're going to be tweeting it as well. But essentially, if you love What's Good Games and you've had a positive experience listening to the show and you have something that you would like to say to us about it that you would be okay with us including as a testimonial in our upcoming video... I would love to hear from you. So you can find that link again at patreon.com slash what's good games or in the Facebook fan page. We will also be posting it on our Facebook wall at facebook.com slash what's good games. And of course, over on Twitter. Uh, that's it. Have a lovely weekend, everybody. We'll be back together, all three of us next week. I know it's been a long time coming, so don't fret. Until then, I'll see you.